That's pretty cool. Very nice. This is um, this is our uh, first little test run at this sort of streaming video. So you know, please bear with us, everyone. Um, we're here today. We're going to talk about uh, the historical Jesus, and just to give a bit of context to what this video is about. Um, we're creating this with uh, a class that I'm teaching in mind, and in this class, it's a it's an introduction to the New Testament, and so this is very much meant to be um, an introduction to uh, the historical Jesus and the idea of the historical Jesus, and what do we even mean by the historical Jesus? Um, and we'll also just talk a little bit about um, our sources. What are our main sources for reconstructing the life of Jesus? Um, Perhaps talk a little bit about methods, what critical methods scholars use. And uh, also we might finish on um, talking just about what some of the current trends are within within scholarship. Um, James and I, uh, it's, it's timely that we're having this conversation because we recently co-authored this book, Jesus, A Life in Class Conflict, um, which... Uh, goes into everything that we're talking about in a much in a lot more detail um, in a heck of a lot more detail but anyway um, so James I'm going to fire away the questions and you're going to uh, answer them and then I'm going to bounce off that and that's how this conversation is going to work fine so the first question what do we mean by the historical Jesus well, there's an obvious answer to this, which is not um, always accepted, but I think it's a useful way of thinking about the topic, even if you don't quite accept the dichotomy I'm about to give. And that is, scholars have really, in practice and sometimes in theory, have seen the historical Jesus as the uh, figure distinct from what is called the Christ of faith. So by the Christ of faith, scholarship would typically mean something like uh, Jesus as presented in the Gospels, Jesus as presented in uh, the letters, Jesus presented in the early church. So this is the, the proclamation of Christ uh, by his followers in the uh, first century onwards. Jesus of history, by contrast, it was typically understood as the figure behind the Gospels, behind the letters, the figure who sort of generated all this adoration, worship and uh, followers. And this is the person we, whose life we try to reconstruct in Galilee and Judea around the in the twenties, around the year thirty, something like this. Um, as as a well, ideally as a biographical figure, someone who uh, we could write a biography just like we could write a biography about any other historical figure, whether it's John Ball, Watt Tyler, or any other great men from history. So. Uh, it's 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 an exercise in historical biography, if you like. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I think just leading on from that question, though, is the is the and I think leading into the next question, um, where I'm going to ask about sources and that kind of thing. Um, but just before we get there, uh, one of the things I wanted to just flag is um, is the idea of. Uh, the historical Jesus as a kind of construction or um, and a scholarly construction, mm -hmm. as opposed to talking about like, you know, an actually uh, existing um, complete picture of a historical figure. Um, rather, it seems that when we're talking about the historical Jesus, and I think we clarify this in our book a little bit by, by saying that we're, we're, um, approximating what we think are some of the earliest traditions uh, that were associated with him and so on, because we kind of don't have um, reason for a sort of certitude about this, right? Mm -hmm. um, we're working with levels of probability and that kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I, I used the word biography previously, and that sort of is what we're trying to do. But ultimately, it's it, it can't be compared with a modern biography or even in many cases, a medieval biography or whatever, because we just, I mean, even if we had the Gospels, we've still got huge swathes of his life missing from uh, the day. We don't, we don't know what he was doing when he was. Hello? Oh, my screen just went on. I'm here. Did, 
Yeah, my screen's went black. <laughs> Perfect. Um, I don't think it was anything that that controversial to say. <laughs> I'm already yeah. being censored. Yeah, yeah. The, the details when Jesus was like, you know, 17 or whatever. Um, so right. there's a lot of details we just don't have. Um, the Gospels themselves uh, quite clearly work with a narrative that they prefer, uh, a framework they prefer, and they even give vague indications of, you know, around this time he did this and then he did that. We don't know. We just we don't have a, a properly interconnected story to give a full detailed biography. So even with the even with a sort of generous reading of the sources we've got, you would still be having to build up your own framework in which to uh, to put the uh, this figure of Jesus. And it's pretty clear that the Gospels don't know the full details of, or or at least don't care about the full details of the chronology of the life of Jesus. I mean, obviously they give a broad outline and, and all that kind of thing. Um, so we've got to guess. Now add to that is that we don't actually have, and, and I'll, I'll come to this in a different way soon, but we don't actually have sort of direct sources from the time. I mean, I mean, you could make the case, and it has been made the case, that behind the Gospels are eyewitness testimony. Okay. But what we don't have is a load of independent eyewitness testimony. We don't have uh, a, a load of material that's been directly written there and then. And, uh, and and that means it's very difficult to raise any of this to the level of proof. So if Jesus was said to have had an argument with the Pharisees about plucking grain on the Sabbath, could it have happened? Sure. Uh, do we know it happened? Uh, no. We, we, I mean, we simply can't push it that far back. We can only say things like uh, we can only either say it could have happened, but we can't prove it, or we might be able to say uh, in certain cases this just reflects later ideas. There's no way these ideas were present around the time of Jesus, and therefore we can say these are reflective of later ideas. So there's uh, so there's all sorts of problems like that, and that's why I think thinking about early themes is the best way to go about it. What were the kind of themes and ideas that were present in Judea and Galilee around the time of Jesus um, and that weren't uh, ideally uh, if, in terms of historical reconstruction weren't that big of an issue or were, weren't of that much interest for the movement as it grew in the decades over the first century. So you can do things like this in terms of themes and we'll come to some of them I think in, in, in due course mm -hmm. but um, I mean I, I would take something like uh, issues to do with Jewish uh, purity law, which were really, by and large, of most interest around Galilee, Judea, of n no concern for a non-Jewish Gentile movement that emerged pretty rapidly in the first century. And so I think we can make some general points that Jesus was engaged with disputes, discussions, interpretations over the nature of Jewish purity law. Uh, so that's that just to give to give one example. Now, can I say that Jesus in, uh, directly engaged with exactly what was said in Mark 7, 1 through to 23 or the passages in Matthew 23 and Luke 11? No. But could we say that there are some general themes emerging concerning purity that were early? Yes. Uh, and I don't lose any sleep worrying whether Jesus, the historical Jesus, engaged with these things or not. But I'm quite content based on the evidence we have, which isn't bad that these were early themes in the ideas, perceptions about Jesus. Yeah, I think that's I think that's useful to just draw that distinction between uh, the historical Jesus and the Jesus that's presented in, say, the Gospel of Mark or, or, or other sources. And um, that, of course, the, the historical Jesus is going to be, um, uh, if we're using, say, Gospel of Mark as a source, it's going to be one of the, the ways in which we come to the, the the themes and ideas that might be associated with mm -hmm. the earliest traditions surrounding Jesus, but to kind of say, well, the historical Jesus said exactly this sentence in this word order yeah. as Mark has it. I, that's what I'm trying to clarify. That yeah. Um, well, we can't. Yeah. I don't think we can yeah. never know. Yeah. Really. And, and that and it's sort of a it, when it, it's a basic historical uh, kind of observation anyway. Yeah. But it, it's it's worth just pointing out. I think when it when it comes comes to this topic, because there's there can be a bit of confusion um, uh, uh, about what we're actually talking about when we say you know whether something may go back to the historical Jesus or not, and and what we're sort of talking about. Um, just, so just a bit more on sources. We've we've touched on 
the Gospels and some of the limitations there. Um, but I think we can draw, um, well, the, the Gospels certainly and um, uh, are um, our primary sources. They give the most kind of detail on, on um, a, a, a narrative structure of, of Jesus's life. Um, Paul, the letters of Paul, there may be some useful material there, but mm -hmm. not yeah. too much, right? Not yeah. too much, but um, uh, because Paul's interests, well, Paul's interests in the letters we've got, I should say, uh, are elsewhere. So he's dealing with problems in Corinth or or, or in Rome or whatever. So sometimes mm -hmm. issues of historical Jesus are just not that relevant. Um, but we do have things like uh, he talking about early traditions early sources or whatever so for instance in 1 corinthians 7 he seems to have um, a similar tradition about divorce that occurs in the gospels and it looks like this is one of those really good pieces of evidence because it looks like we have some independent um sources for uh floating around about jesus saying something on divorce uh the the, the there's there's others but the uh, one the bit different one which is worth flagging up i think is also in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15 is uh, about appearances of Jesus after he died. So we, no, I don't think there's any need for us to get into debates about you know, what does resurrection mean and things like that. But it's fairly clear that uh, the earliest followers of Jesus and would-be converts to the, uh, to the Jesus movement had uh, uh, believed they'd seen the risen Jesus. And Paul gives us some uh, early evidence of that, about traditions that have been passed on from the you know just after uh the death of so jesus I, 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 I wasn't i wasn't going to go there but um and seeing as you did raise that example and it is a good example and it's an early it's an early source and comparatively of the material we've got for that tradition um but what do we do with the supernatural and historical jesus research well um i i would what i would do is just bracket it out there's no need for us to go there um, people yeah. can argue about uh, philosophers, theologians can argue about uh, whether these things happen and what the supernatural intervention in history. But I'm pretty strict as a historian in terms of these questions aren't my questions. And so um, it doesn't mean we bracket it out entirely. I mean, we can still say, why do people why do people believe this? Why do people have stories about this and so on? So I'm quite happy for the idea. And I think it's quite important to acknowledge the idea that um, the first followers uh, claim to experience visions and things like this of of, of the risen Jesus yeah, or, I mean, if it's, or whatever. If it was part of if supernatural intervention is is part of their worldview, yeah, and they sincerely believe that, then we can talk about or how they sincerely, sincerely believe, believe it as well. I mean, who cares? Yeah, uh, it's yeah. it's yeah. just um, it's it, that's that's there. That's part of it. But um, I don't yeah. think for a historian to be saying uh, now I've proved or disproved uh, the supernatural. It's just that's a question for philosophers. If, if 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 I don't know if philosophers even care, but you know, uh, feel theological philosophers or philosophical theologians, whichever way around, um, is what whatever whatever. The, I mean, that's a question for them. And and even there, I, I suspect we're probably dealing with only a certain type of theologian who who's interested in those kind of questions. I think we. I mean, I think it's it's just a waste of time for a historian to be doing that. I mean, what can I say if I, I can say look. Lots of people believed there were miracles. Uh, there were lots of independent stories about Jesus producing miracles. Fine. To, but to say that now I've proved that miracles happen, well, no. I say, I've just proved that people believed in them. That's that's the best mm. we can do. Mm. Um, so I, I think those kind of hyper-skeptical questions or hyper-confessional questions about whether people did or didn't, uh, whether these things did or didn't happen, um, as in whether the supernatural can intervene in history for a different different genre of of scholarly activity. Uh, yeah, I suppose um, historical Jesus research often gets um, invoked by and perhaps sometimes confused with uh, apologetics, whether kind of mm. atheist apologetics or, or Christian, um, often Christian fundamentalist type apologetics, you know, yeah. proof and uh the, the yeah. truth claims about the supernatural in christianity or what have you um and um that's kind of in my understanding at least it's not really what historical jesus research 
is doing or talking about or attempting to no. do. There are there are issues to do with uh, um, what you know uh, what can be verified and and um, mm -hmm. the best explanation for um, particular ideas or, or what have you, but it's sort of a different as you say a different genre than that kind of apologetics yeah. um, approach I mean, it's not denied it's, it's very popular you go on like, sort of facebook groups mm. and they're arguing all the time and they will invoke historical jesus scholarship mm. so it's not mm. i mean it's definitely popular but um for me it's that's that's kind of what it is is you people to argue on the internet about who's god's best <laughs> yeah yeah or not yeah so we've talked so in terms of sources yeah, so maybe there's fleeting guidance from the letters of Paul. Yeah. Um, uh, I think later texts within the New Testament um, are not particularly helpful uh, um, because they're, they're sort of they, they, the further you get from from Jesus, it seems the the um, well, I, I I don't know. Well, like, no, I mean, as a rule of thumb, the yeah. further you get, uh, the more likely you are to be um, dealing with issues and theological disputes from a later time. Early mm. doesn't necessarily mean historically accurate either. Um, you, people can create stories within seconds uh, if they want to, um, never mind 10 years, five years or whatever. Um, but but I, I, yeah, as, a, yeah, as a rule yeah, of thumb, yeah. the earlier the better. Uh I think as a useful rule of thumb, but with all due caveat that, that this could be a problem still. Yeah, I suppose outside of the New Testament, you've got um, the these non-canonical gospels, mm. uh, so-called Gnostic gospels, and so on. Um, but these are coming from a, 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 a much later time, like a couple of centuries later. So they seem to be telling us more about what Christians believed about Jesus at that time, rather yeah, than from the second century giving almost. us yeah. um, useful information about the historical Jesus. Although I think in the book, we have a couple of examples where there, there might be uh, independent um, uh, traditions being um, circulated kind of independent mm. of, of the canonical gospels. Right? Yeah. So they yeah, may are be useful few, in, in interesting there are a few, Yeah. Yeah. There are a few yeah. bits and pieces, but I mean, again, it's not going to tell whole, us a huge not, amount. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, and often those gospels were were interested in filling in the gaps of material that weren't mm. in, wasn't included within the canonical gospels, right? Um, okay, and then what about other sources out? You know, non Christian sources. Um, so uh, famously, um, you know, the Jewish historian Josephus has this passage about Jesus, but that's highly contentious. It seems like either some or possibly most of the material in there um, was not original to Je Josephus, but rather was edited or modified by, yeah. by Christian scribes who are transmitting that text. But even so, even, I mean, this is uh, one of the issues we have with uh, non-Christian sources. So it's Josephus or Tacitus or whatever, is that even if we take the whole, the whole passage of Josephus at face value, it's simply a recording of a reporting of what people uh, of that was already known before that. Uh, same with Tacitus. I mean, they're reporting the activities of, in the case of Tacitus, of Christians, presumably. Uh, and, uh, and I mean, it's not independent. It's not really any independent details about the historical genes. It doesn't, even if these things were absolutely spot on, independent, whatever, they're not telling us very much. And anyway, given that uh, when they were written, they're already reporting what was established that, Christians believed in this figure who was active in uh, Galilee or whatever. So they, they, they're, they're very limited in what they can tell us at all, I think. Mm, mm. Um, I, I mean, I think it's it's worth pointing out or something that I like to point out is that even though these uh, these other sources and particularly I'm, I'm thinking of Josephus are not are not so helpful for reconstructing the the individual historical Jesus as such. Um, his writings are incredibly useful in addition to some other texts and, and, and mm -hmm. data from the, from uh, that period of bringing to life the, the social and broader historical context yeah. in which yeah. we're going to situate Jesus. Yeah, so, I mean, um, you know, Jesus isn't just this kind of free floating individual who said some things and did some things rather he was embedded within a social and historical context that 
you know, already had particular currents and, and ideas that were that were live, and he took options of various um, uh, of these various themes and ideas that were available to him. So these other sources can help us reconstruct the world that he was a yeah. part of, right? Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, especially with Josephus, we've got a Jewish historian who's talking about that very part of the world and the kind of ideas and disputes and things like this that were, were happening again with Josephus. We still, we don't know. We've still got questions of historical accuracy, of course, but it, um, it, it's important. He's still important. Even, even if he, even if he didn't, but even if he made up all these kind of stories, we've got an insight into the kinds of ideas that were present from that part of the world, the way they constructed the world, the way they understood the world, the way they understood, um, things to do with rich and poor and all this kind of thing. So we've got the ideas there of uh, from that part of the world, which I think are important for understanding the historical Jesus or the early ideas about him. Yep. All right. So we've talked a bit about um, uh, sources. So uh, my next question is about methods. Um, we can we can do this quickly, I, I think. Um, we don't need to get too bogged down on the detail here. But just generally speaking, what kinds of methods do, do scholars use to reconstruct the historical Jesus? Well, I mean, there's traditionally been what's called the criteria of authenticity. And this is a set of approaches, methods, or something like this, to see how far back we can get, and we can get uh, until we get to something approximating to the historical Jesus. So to give one criterion, uh, the criterion of uh, multiple attestation and this is the idea that if a, uh, an idea is found independently in sources uh, and forms in the gospels then it's more it's likely to be more likely to be reflective of the historical jesus and by so independent sources this would be we need to have some idea of what we mean by that and so scholars think mark is the first source uh He's the earliest gospel. Mark's got the earliest gospel and that Matthew and Luke copied Mark. So where Matthew and Luke copied Mark, that it, that would simply be Mark. That would be the independent source. We couldn't say, oh, look, Luke right. and Matthew copied him. There's two more independent sources. No. But there's also material particular to Matthew and Luke. And uh, a common explanation for this is that they had an independent source, usually labeled Q. Uh, and that would be in the scholarly imagination, another independent source. So if a theme about, I don't know, apocalypticism or purity or uh, conflict with the Pharisees or whatever appeared in Mark and it appeared in Q, then you would have independent uh, independent attestation. And better still, if you could see something in one of Paul's letters. Yeah. Or you could find I think something. like a good example of this might be, um, well, we've talked about a couple of things in, in Paul, but um, also... Um, the reference to the Lord's Supper in, uh, or as Jesus is teaching, right? Um, yeah. In First Corinthians might be another example. So you've got a kind of another independent source, but I guess that it, it, it's still it, it's um, contentious in a way because how we, how do we really know that these different sources were truly independent? Um, well, I mean, how do we know that you know Mark hadn't wasn't familiar with even if he had just heard a, a reading of of some of Paul's letters, is, yeah. you know, there's sort of no way to know this um, for sure. No, I mean, I mean, they all share similar ideas. So that's, that's of course possible. I mean, they, they could be variants on a common story, for instance. So it, mm. it does have some, that, that, that's a problem in its own way. I mean, this is why I think sometimes what we can get with this is th th these ideas were pre-gospel. They are early. They're not taking us back to the historical Jesus. But if, Paul's got a version of the Last Supper, and the Gospels have a sort of version of it. Or they've got this, or the teaching on divorce, for instance, occurs in Paul, uh, occurs in Mark, and there's a, a version which we could probably call Q, or at least independent of uh, the others. Uh, well, that t that probably means that that this interest in the divorce saying is early. It predates the Gospels. Um, it was floating around, and we could do this with a few other things. But it yeah, doesn't. And as you said, the, the resurrection, the you know Jesus, Jesus being yeah. like miracles, so in believing that yeah. yeah. story. So, yeah. Um, yeah. It, it, what what multiple attestation really means, or should mean, is that we can probably establish something is early and pre-gospel, or at least pre-gospel, or something like that. So it's not without its uses, but it's not 
a hard science to get us back to the historical mm. Jesus mm. at all. And others are similar. So there's a criterion of embarrassment, for instance. If something is embarrassing to the gospel writer, then it's more likely to go back to the historical Jesus. Um, the problem with this is, is it ends up being, we're, we're dealing with traditions from Mark often, and Mark's not really that embarrassed by some stuff. So when he uh, Jesus returns to Nazareth in Mark 6, uh, Matthew has a little bit of a problem with Jesus' rejection. but uh, And, it, well, as Mark frames it, inability to perform uh, mighty deeds and healings there, um, or however he words it. Uh, whereas... Uh, Matthew does think, well, he, more Jesus refused to do it than he, he could, uh, he, he was unable to do it. Uh, but but Mark shows no embarrassment. So is that embarrassing? Embarrassment's kind of in the eye of the embarrassed, mm. I suppose. Uh, and, 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 uh, yeah. and again, it's quite subjective, isn't it? Yeah. It, can, it can be. And, and so um, what the one way you can flip that is to say something like, um, well, would Mark invent the idea that Jesus was. Uh, not as powerful as perhaps he should be. Well, okay, that that's got something to it as well, and you can you, you can you can make arguments along those lines that uh, this doesn't this suggests that you know that this is not something that Mark would typically make Jesus better or something like that. Okay, I can I can get that as an argument again. That if but if that argument holds weight, it's, it again means that's a pre-gospel tradition it's not necessarily taking us back to the historical jesus directly and there's others you can do this with like aramaic i mean there's some very there's a couple of good examples where um a, a phrase or a turn of phrase can be explained best with reference to aramaic and and again that would probably suggest a pre-gospel form uh and uh but but the first followers of jesus were some of them we know were Aramaic speakers, obviously his disciples, his first followers like that, did Peter and so on. So influence of Aramaic could come at any stage, really, mm -hmm. in the first century. But again, I mean, if some stuff does make better sense in Aramaic, then you could make a case that this you can make is an a pre-gospel yeah. thing from that part of the world, from the language Jesus spoke. And if you bring some of these arguments together in collective way, you can, again, they make a, a strong argument that this stuff is early. Mm, and I did mm. mention before forms. What I meant by forms was, uh, so we've got sources like Mark, Q, Paul, or whatever, as independent, possibly independent sources. But forms would be if a theme occurs in Mark, Q, Paul, or whatever, but you also see it in a parable or a conflict story or something like this, that would be an indication of independence. Again, I mean, I think it's a bit weaker, th that version. But you can perhaps start to make some general comments like this. And this is to make a, I think so do, so like great. yeah so so an idea that um like a, a particular teaching or something of Jesus that comes across through multiple different types of of traditions with even within the same sources yeah um, I, it would be if, I, if I it keeps thinking, coming up if this idea or this thing keeps coming up then it seems like it may independent and then it may kind of, yeah. yeah again yeah I mean combined I with some it, of those other things it All could right. be just be popular um, so um I think that's that's helpful. I think um, we've 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 talked a bit about, or we've flagged that um, these these kinds of arguments, this uh, criteria approach, is uh, not without uh, not without its issues. And I think that's pretty um, current within historical Jesus research. There's yeah. definitely a shift towards um, less dependence upon these sorts of criteria approaches where you look mm -hmm. at it as a, you know, you, you examine each tradition independently and see if you can uh, find it multiply attested or if it has an Aramaic under, uh, underlying background or something like that, right? So um, uh, this is where, uh, leading me to where I, I wanted to kind of wrap up, which is the some of the current trends within historical Jesus research, but just in the interest of time, I think I want to just raise one and maybe get you to add some comments on it. And um, this is is something that that um, we definitely do in our book, although I have seen it coming across in, in, in quite a bit of the other uh, literature um, that's been published in recent years, and that's referring not so much to um, the historical Jesus as this kind of individual um, or great man singular person who um, 
kind of did everything and thought everything up by himself and changed history effectively by himself. And to speak more of a, a broader Jesus movement and to see and to talk about, I suppose, um, this this broader movement, whether it was a kind of social or religious movement or something of, of the two combined, um, uh, and to talk about um, that movement as such, out of which Jesus emerged and becomes a prominent leader, or as we put it, a, a religious organizer. Um, so do you have any any thoughts or ideas uh, that you wanted to add to that? Um, well, I think as, as a kind of current direction and in, in, or trend in historical Jesus research, I think it's it's sort of taking off as a product of um, skeptic, partly as a product of skepticism towards how much we can know about the precise words Jesus said or not, and then skepticism towards these criteria, where you're kind of forced to think really in broader terms that we're, okay, these are this is these ideas are being. Uh, presented transmitted or whatever by groups of people uh socially so, so to speak and and less on the the individual thing behind them and maybe there's an amalgamation of ideas taking place perhaps even after Jesus' death perhaps during Jesus' lifetime that you're kind of forced to think more collectively anyway i think and i think that that's a, a good side effect of the skepticism towards the uh, criteria um i think it's there's good reasons to do it anyway even if we knew all the details of the words of jesus uh, and we had a full biography of the words of jesus to understand where he's coming from and why and people are products of their social circumstances and jesus is no exception uh, we know for instance of some significant uh, upheavals happening in galilee for instance as he was growing up we've got two major building projects which will extract resources from villages like nazareth uh, to build places like Sepphoris or rebuild Sepphoris and build Tiberius in Galilee. Uh, we also know that people were being given gifts of land and people were being taken away from the land. Uh, so there were there were known upheavals happening in Galilee at the time. And when you think about some of the stuff in the Gospels about uh, problems with uh, conflict within family and things like this, we could make a case at least that these are a product of what was happening in Galilee at the time. I think something like apocalypticism, uh, predictions about the kingdom and uh, predictions and expectations of great transformation of the world are a part of this, uh, a part of this, what's happening in Galilee. And we can make a pretty strong case that this is early material, uh, incidentally. And mm -hmm. and so um, I, I think it's, it's a way of trying to address the problem that things have changed quite dramatically in Galilee and not everybody was happy with the changes some will have been some weren't but for those who weren't the jesus movement provided uh, an, uh the option of a well at least the idea of a transformed world in the in the uh, in the near future and i think you can understand this as a product of the changing social circumstances of the time and there's a lot of material about rich and poor being uh, flipped and a lot of hostility to wealth some scholars say, well, this is just a sort of ancient trope, but but this is quite, there's a lot of it, a lot mm -hmm. of dense material about this in, in the gospel tradition. I'd say, where's this coming from? And I'd say, in this instance, it's a product of what was happening in Galilee at the time. Awesome. All right. I think uh, that's a good place to end the video. So thanks very much. And thanks everyone for watching.